a system-based approach is, I will say, a key concept that you explore in the book. So uh, can you briefly explain to our audience uh, what it is? What do you mean by a systems-based approach? Um, You're looking at me. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Timon. <laughs> I will take a stab at that. Um, I, I think it is actually a key component of the book is really thinking about the sort of systems nature of the problems that we're facing and the need for a systems approach to solve them. If you take, I don't know, an example of the way in which um, climate, climate change is causing extreme events to happen around the world and cities are a place where they're concentrated infrastructure, concentrations of people. So we see some of the most dramatic impacts of climate change in urban spaces. And it's not as if it's some kind of very linear, you know, it gets warmer and just a certain kind of infrastructure fails. What we see is this cascading of interactions when any kind of event happens where uh, transportation systems break down and communication systems break down and water delivery and food delivery breaks down. And so to solve those problems, it's not, uh, it's not just sucking carbon out of the air. It's actually thinking about how we come together with multiple forms of knowledge, as we've been talking about, a diversity of voices that makes it more innovative. We have more innovations when we have more people at the table to think about how we solve, in some cases, very wicked problems that are really challenging. So in the book, I think, um, to the point you're talking about, uh, people that can move between these spaces. So some of the examples in the book are also on the sort of academic side, sort of researchers getting out of these sort of more traditional boundaries that they've been in for, I don't know, maybe the history of scholarship in some way, uh, to get outside of that into the very uncomfortable space in some ways of learning how to do work while studying the sort of best ways to do that. So the systems uh, thinking approach and this uh, linkage of different kinds of knowledge and understanding is a key component that we're trying to, on the one hand, talk about, but also think about how do we do more of that. So the book has, I think, rich discussion, um, but there's much more to, much more discussion to have, um, but also to think about where is the practice, like where does the rubber meets the road. I know all of you have examples of that. My contribution to this particular book was pretty modest. It was one of these provocations, but I love that format as a chance to just speak my mind on an issue as someone who's trying to um, go between these spaces of being a practicing scientist, but then being engaged in discussions with municipal government or, or policy leaders. Um, and I think one of the points of my piece is very much along the lines of what um, you just said. It's like, we can sometimes get very focused on our own particular disciplines jargon and then that can be a barrier to talking to other people and and it, it I, I guess I was trying to say in my piece it's it is hard Deborah to your point to talk to other audiences it's uncomfortable um, but I think we have to do it and, there, and I was just trying to plea with more scientists to get out there and do it and not so much worry about the terminology. So there's a lot of terminology around, are we co-producing knowledge? Are we doing interdisciplinary knowledge versus transdisciplinary? And there's interesting battles between those different words. And I'm not minimizing that there is distinctions and value to terminology, but I've never met a mayor or you know sustainability officer who cares if it's transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary. Or, you know, they want to have a discussion about the problems they have and how... They can solve them, and what? And we want to bring science and knowledge to bear to those kinds of decisions. So you have to be ready to meet them uh, in the language and the jargon that they're using to make that decision. So that was kind of the theme of of what I was saying. And I, I do like this back and forth in the book between traditional academic chapters and then more thought pieces or essays that are definitely having opinions. It was fun to to write. This is maybe just to call out some specifics in the book, like the chapters that you're calling out. There's a chapter in the book called Embracing Urban Complexity. And there's a reason why, on the one hand, it's titled that. Um, and there's also a reason why there's sort of a focused chapter in the beginning of it to really talk about the complexity of urban systems and that they're, they're not simple. And so, you know, so just to underline this point about um, systems approaches, but systems is kind of a buzzword as well. So we're talking about integrated approaches and multiple kinds of knowledge, multiple kinds of... Um, innovations coming together and that that chapter is there for a reason it's to sort of say that we've got we, we can't sort of pretend that systems are less complex than they are and we can't sort of approach problems with a sort of you know uh, let's say 
just the technical solution and not worry about behavior change, right? We have to be doing kind of all things at once, and I think this goes to the urgency of the problems that we're facing here on a very urban planet that's um, undergoing a lot of kinds of change. Comments, just to offer up another point on, I think, the complexity and the dynamism of these systems, and they're, they're human systems, they're, it's infrastructure, it's climate systems, um, and increasingly the speed with which these are being changed and disrupted, either by climactic systems or technology, shouldn't be underestimated. And I know we're talking a lot about academia, but this also holds true for local government. Local government is also siloed out of, out of its nature. So you've got a department of planning, you've got a department of housing, you've got a department of transportation. And, and just to Rob's point, you, it's very easy to get very focused and very specific on what you're getting paid every day to do. Increasingly, those those have those inter intergovernmental relationships and and departments need to be coordinating. So, for an example, when Uber or Lyft comes around and you have share, car sharing and hire sharing for cars, that disrupts radically a city's 15-year transportation plan. And all of a sudden, you have dot giant modal shifts between people who are walking, cycling, taking the subway, taking the bus because they can get in a, in a car, and that really, really is disruptive to a city, their planning process, their budget process, and, and it gets directly into all these other interconnected systems. So what is your transportation plan? What's your road surface paving program? What's your sidewalk setbacks? What's your zoning for buildings? All of those then cross across three or four other different departments, not just your taxi fleet, as, as a simple example. Yeah, no, and there's a potential, um, I mean, this is, I don't know if this is even in the book, but this is huge potential for for car sharing and then driverless cars as well to really radically change how cities grow and how they have to think about metro area zoning. And I mean, it's going to be a dramatic few decades. I think.